Over the past half decade or so, video essays have taken over YouTube. There was a time when the platform was primarily associated with prank videos, fail compilations, and daily vlogs. But these days, a significant portion of the site's largest creators and most popular videos are at least video essay adjacent. It is, of course, a staggeringly broad genre. From its humble beginnings primarily as a medium for film analysis, the phrase video essay is now used to describe documentaries, commentary videos, reaction videos, educational explainers, opinion pieces, and I'm sure much, much more depending on who you're talking to. In today's episode of Induction, I want to take stock of where the genre has come from, where it is now, and where it might be going in the future. And in order to do so, I asked Neil from The Leftist Cooks to join me for a chat. So, Neil, welcome to the show. You are a uh, brilliant, brilliant uh, video creator, uh, along with Sarah um, on The Leftist uh, Cooks. Uh, you create wonderful uh, music. I mean, I was just looking at your your studio behind you mm -hmm. is a kind of wonderful uh there's, there's one whole creativity in the fact you have, not only do you have your camera set up, uh, I mean, for anyone who's just listening, uh, Neil not only has the camera set up, but also an easel and a uh, keyboard of some description. Is that? Yeah. You know what? It, it's funny, actually. And this might seem contrived uh, <laughs> for all we know it is. <laughs> But uh, yeah, this is the control keyboard for the composing. And then the easel just happens to be there because because uh, kids and creativity. But it's a lovely little corner of creativity over here. Um, and um, yeah, I'm in the privileged position of being able to sit at a desk and write, edit and compose music all from the one spot. Um, which is like absolute dream job for me at this point. You just swivel your chair over to to play over here and then back to editing over there precisely yeah and it, it really it, it it's literally dream job it, it, it's a combination of uh you know that i think i think maybe it's apocryphal but there is a story about albert einstein like if he couldn't figure out how to uh, uh, uh how to crack a problem mathematically he would just go and play discordant piano um, and then it would like use the other part of his brain and and free up the knot. And I know I don't know. It yeah. sort, sort of sounds I find like the that something that might be made up. Well, I I often find that if I'm stuck on a bit of writing and there's a there's a sentence I can't quite work out what shape it's meant to take, I'll sometimes decide that I'm going to go and get a glass of water or something from downstairs. And about halfway down the stairs, it something clicks. Right. And sometimes it's just not being at the computer and sometimes that is i'll go and noodle badly on the guitar or or hit some keys on the piano very badly or um play some legend of zet like just just doing something else yes. suddenly like loosens your brain a little bit and suddenly all the bits connect yeah absolutely um and which i think is there's probably some very basic and um useful psychology in that that doesn't we, that we need not go too far with but also it reminds me of um the character of dirk gently uh where you know he's the holistic detective and he'll chase up any connections between anything because ultimately everything is connected and so in order the first step of solving uh, a mystery is to just drive around the ring roads in london um because they're they're connected to everything so yeah my i i will say that i feel that uh this room looks quite ordered but because i've been filming just basically anything off camera this way uh is just tripods and uh, uh cables all in a sort of not particularly uh creative way in a sort of just just sort of cross the line from creativity into into just mess really. right um so the reason that i asked to to sit down for a, a lovely chat with you was partly as an excuse to to have a have a chat which is sort of a good 50 percent of this podcast is just tom having an excuse to chat to to cool people about stuff uh but I was really interested in, there's been a lot of kind of meta discussion recently about video essays as a form, which is something which I th think a lot of, 
I guess both of us in some way probably consider ourselves to make and definitely as a label that I think other people would probably put on uh, both our work. Uh, and one of the uh, conversations, one of the videos that was starting conversation around that was a video that you made I uh, maybe a couple of months ago now? A couple of months ago now, yeah. Yeah, um, called uh, This Is Not A Video Essay. And so I thought you would be a wonderful person to chat to um, because you clearly have reflected deeply on this as a a craft and as a genre, I guess. Uh, well, thanks. I mean, it is great to have an excuse to hang out anyway. So yeah, that that's as good a thing to talk about as any. And uh, yeah, I have thought about this deeply because I think, honestly, um, there, there are cynical and naive ways to frame the contemporary um, movements in art and in media in general. And I know that there's a lot of sort of bemoaning uh, remakes and, uh, you know, adaptations and everything being derived from a comic or a remake of a adaptation of a comic. Um, and also this sort of strange, sometimes dirty word, sometimes meaningless word, meta. Um, and I think that, that a lot of the a lot of the ways that, that gets framed is is in the sort of cynical shorthand. Whereas what's really happening is um that in the postmodern, post-postmodern era, we're all looking at the things we've made and commenting on them. And of course, the genre of, of video essay, and we can get into where that came from and why it is the way it is, but because it is the way it is, it is the, the medium where art comments on art. That's essentially what it, what it is. You know, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. human struggles to make things understood, commenting on uh, in the case of videos about videos, uh, like com commenting on other art. And as video essays become, I, sp I suppose, a kind of mainstream outlet of artistic expression and a very, like, like an, a saturated market of, of content, uh, there's just more to comment on and there's, there's, there's things happening to comment on. And so this, this process of meta, which you could cynically say is, um, is just a thing to do when you've got nothing else to talk about, right? You just, you just navel gaze. Well, rather it's actually just the thing to comment on because it's happening. Um, there's a lot of video essays happening and so comment upon them, uh, just like this conversation here. Um, and they're becoming more artistic. So that's our job is to comment on art anyway, right? It's interesting that you use the word navel gazing. In my notes, I did write uh, the phrase, uh, this has the potential to be a pretty navel gazing episode uh, in that I want. <laughs> um, but, um, but I think it's really interesting, actually, that you're kind of drawing that connection with um, the art uh, form which involves, which always involves some kind of commentary on something else yes. uh, in some regard, whatever the subject of that commentary is. The thing that seems to define a video essay is that it's talking about something that's happening in the world or has happened in the world. It's talking about a film. It's talking about a Twitter debate, uh, that, that, that it is a commentary upon something else. Uh, and it's interesting you drawing the connection between kind of su superhero films or whatever, because those in themselves feel like they've got a lot more uh, self-referential in the sense that I uh, I recently saw the new uh, Spider-Man uh, film, the Across the Spider-Verse, I think it is, uh, which is, which I have, have you seen yet? Mm-hmm. You have. I have. Uh, Spider-Verse? Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah. Because that's and interesting. That sort of comments on the stories that we, the, the stories that are told about Spider-Man and it, it is itself a kind of commentary on the thing that it is. Um, so there's some really interesting uh, kind of connections there between stuff that is being made on uh, YouTube, the, the, the platform on which some people will be watching this, and stuff that it is existing uh, on more mainstream uh, platforms, you know, in the in the cinema or on 
Disney Plus or wherever. I, I don't know where that comes out for streaming. Um, that, that feels like maybe actually there is something in the water more broadly. Um, but I did, I did sort of want to start from the point of view, sort of being aware that this is going to be quite a subjective conversation in that we are uh, two people who are in the water of the thing that we're discussing and therefore can't really be overly distanced from it. Uh, I, I was sort of interested to ask you, how did you come to the uh, craft of making uh, video essays? What was your first um, interaction with them maybe as an audience member? And then what was the thing that got you into making the wonderful videos that you do? Uh, yeah, well, I think I was probably an early adopter as an audience member and then a latecomer mm. as a creator. Um, it's funny, I would have watched um, Nerd Rider and um, Every Frame of Painting um, and, you know, the early uh, bread tube stuff from quite early on. Um not as a, a lifestyle choice so much. And I wasn't on mm. Twitter. I wasn't really developing parasocial bonds with those creators. Mm. But from the perspective of this is more interesting than a lot of television. Um, and I liked the places it went to as a, as a, as a, uh, a genre, it, it sort of, will nudge up against something like every frame of painting or a nerd writer or a good contrapoint will nudge up against a kind of transcendent conclusion without all that terrible business of having to read. Um, <laughs> or, you know, um, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit gentler. So I was just enjoying that and sort of had it compartmentalized in my brain as the, um, the 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 one person creative um making a great documentary having an inspired thought in this small scale platform that felt a little bit like out of left field like a little bit mine and uh other people mm -hmm. don't watch essays you know for years like as far back as like 2014 um and um, it's interesting it's interesting that you mention it being less of a kind of lifestyle choice at that point i guess um i was thinking back uh, when prepping for this about um similarly i think i probably probably nerd writer was maybe the first uh person that i came across that was doing this kind of stuff i didn't in fact i don't know if i've ever watched an every frame the painting video i think i've watched a bit of ideas channel um but i but i was never really in the kind of channel awesome soup which seems to be another kind of yes part part of the prehistory of, of the video essay almost um and it was interesting thinking back to how kind of casual a lot of those videos are i think uh i think it's evan isn't it the uh, nerd writer yeah I evan think he Bushak, yeah. Used, used to sort of start with this uh, sort of coffee on a tuesday kind of thing it was this very kind of it's very relaxed very here's the starts of some thoughts about something in a way that does feel that it contrasts a little bit with the tendency these days to be much more have to make the authoritative uh, video about a certain topic, um, which maybe which maybe doesn't. I think there are still people who manage to pull off the slightly more casual uh, riffing off a uh, idea or two, um, but but the central trend these days seems to be a bit more. Uh, trying to make something kind of complete, I guess. Um, whereas early on there was, was, and I'm not sort of suggesting either of these are for better or for worse necessarily, but it did seem to start off as this very, very kind of casual thing of here's some sort of beginnings of some thoughts about something. What, a, what, what do you think kind of, kind of vibe? Uh, I agree. I, I think um, the way I would uh, parse that difference uh, because, you know, Evan as a writer, um, it is, is very masterfully, uh, creating that, that casual atmosphere. Um, and the soft persuasion is, I think, very intentional, but the, mm -hmm. the difference I think now is, is that videos like every, uh, from every frame of painting is wonderful. They're, they're incredible essays and, and those early, 
um, essays were sort of competing with all other videos on YouTube, right? Um, mm. Videos where, um, and the audience, the, the audience was less segmented, I think, and, and perhaps less tribal. Um, and the algorithm, uh, in some ways better at its job and in some ways worse in that it's delivering random things to random people, which is very interesting and shakes things up a lot. But, but now, you know, the audience centered model uh, of the Google algorithm and the YouTube algorithm um, means that people get the content that they want. And so people who watch video essays are going to get video essays. And so you'll see, and there was a period, I think it's probably even died off now, but there's a period where, video essays would have the words video essay in the title, right? Yeah. Uh, it, w it would say something like, you know, um, yeah, y y y y um, Lex Luthor is uh, Jeff Bezos, a video essay or whatever, you know. Um, so um, that, sort, that, that, that sort of having to, having to compete with other video essays is very different to just making a youtube video that's kind of it's just a playful little it's just some thoughts it's just a little doc about about stuff and i think some of the um legacy creators and evan is still uh, creating in fact i i think he he's he's promoting a book right now um yeah. but um yeah i think some of the legacy creators are some of the older people who kind of sit in the uh, the outskirts of video essays like um, Defunct Land or somebody like that will still have that vibe of like, well, this is just a YouTube video, you know? Um, or even somebody like Jose doing a retrospective of a TV show, um, almost better off not signaling that it's a video essay, right? Because video essays mm -hmm. started to take on this connotation of, um, y you know, of, of having to have... Um, a thesis and an antithesis, an antithesis and a synthesis, right? A conclusion. And you don't necessarily want to have one of those when you're just talking about the the rides at Disneyland that no longer run or, uh, you know, how fun it was when we used to watch Cheers. That's interesting, actually. You're talking about actually the subtle persuasion of it that just because it's just because something seems casual on the outside doesn't necessarily mean that it's not doing deep work beneath the surface i guess uh i mean uh, sort of h bomber guy being someone who's very good at starting with something that seems very esoteric and or, or very i don't know marginal and sort of like it doesn't matter all that much or sort of whimsical yeah. and then gradually taking you to some uh much deeper deeper place um uh as the video goes on um I, i'm sort of thinking about how in what is maybe still his latest video i think about the the roblox oof he kind of starts from this place of discussing the sound effect and where did it come from and then much later in the video he's suddenly to this place about the ways in which a lot of women's contributions to the history of video games have been uh, kind of pushed to one side and not recorded, and and you're like I've, I, I'm, I can I fully understand how we got from one to the other, but when 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 we were on step one, I never would have assumed that this was where it was going to end up. Um, what I mean, what brought you to 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 making videos yourself? What at what point did did you go? Oh, this is something that I want to try contributing to as well as just um uh re receiving in some way yeah um so basically um my my partner and co-creator sarah um made me do it <laughs> but for a number of benevolent reasons um so she had not i mean she's an an incredible writer researcher and presenter now in her own right and um you know, I, we're really lucky that we work together and it's sort of rare, I think, um, and it, it stands to us um, that, that there's two brains in the room taking care of very different bits of business. But like, you know, Sarah had never really engaged with video essays, thought that YouTube was just the place you go to see old Grateful Dead concerts, you know. Um, and then that, that was it, uh, or, or, you know, or maybe fish. Uh, <laughs> um, so I was like, oh no, I think you'd really, I think you of all people would really like, 
uh, Lindsay Ellis. I think you would really enjoy, you know, um, Tom Nicholas, you know. So um, uh, at that point, Sarah was kind of looking at these skill sets and going like, hang on, okay, so this is academic research. This is um, like good old fashioned presentation and showbiz. It's got to have music. It's got to have editing. And it's got to have like charming presentation. And and Sarah was looking at her skill set as a as a writer researcher, somebody who comes from a debate background, and a number of different academic roles at various points. Um, and then me with a background in stand up comedy, com- composing music, professional music, like live music, and um, you know as a video editor as well, and as somebody who studied film, I kind of going like, well, this is ridiculous. If you put all of these things like together. Um, we have kind of no excuse not to do this. Um, <laughs> and then the final inciting, um, drive, I think was that we, you know, um, there were a couple of things that we, we felt there was a gap in the market. There was a space where things weren't being covered. Well, mm. um, there, there, things weren't being talked about in the way that we, we would talk about them. And one of those was polyamory and ethical non-monogamy. It just felt like, um, on the one side, there was the kind of full tilt queer liberation, um, you know, pro doms talking about it and saying like, yeah, you know, because this is just good because, and it's like more power to you, you know, that's, that's great. But then on, and then outside of that, there the kind of wasn't this like soft middle ground, um, this sort of family friendly middle ground where it's just, we're just people and it's just, it's just ethical non-monogamy. I mean, let's, let's relax. Let's explain this in a video that you could send to your parents. That was the idea, you know, a video that you could conceive if you were poly, you could conceivably send this to your parents and we were going to be sound enough and emotionally persuasive enough. And that sort of was the ambition. And we, we, we decided to do a few trial run videos to get good enough to make that video. Um, didn't know what would happen after that. And it sort of set the standard. It sort of set the atmosphere that we were trying to make videos that weren't necessarily family friendly is probably the wrong word, but like had a gentle tone um, mm. and had an emotionally vulnerable tone, um, but really did the work with the research and were comprehensive and kind of like watertight. That was, that was the ambition. Which I think, which I, I think it comes, I think you, you succeed on that ambition in terms of that. Um, I mean, that, that kind of gentleness that I guess we were talking about that goes back to, uh, nerd writer of kind of being welcomed into uh, a video, I guess. And maybe I, I feel like maybe we'll come back to this kind of mix between that accessibility and authenticity and that, and that, then the, the other end of that being that kind of weightiness that you're, you're kind of talking about as well. Cause I think those things are often uh, <laughs> the sort of two wolves mm-hmm. fighting in any, uh, in any video essay it's also interesting you talk about that idea of wanting to create something either to show to people yourselves as a kind of you know wanting to explain polyamory and going okay well actually if we you know sit down and make a video about it we've got something that is uh pre-thought that we can show to people, i guess but also wanting something that other people could send to stuff i know um uh Lena Norms, who we had on an episode recently, has occasionally made videos that that start with um, kind of if someone has sent you this video, it's because they want you to know more about dot 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 as this kind of you know a- acknowledging that this might be ammunition is the wrong word, I guess that feels that feels too. I suppose it could be an olive branch as mm-hmm. much as a, um, but it, it's something that that can be a tool, I guess, a, a tool that someone. Um, could use in uh as a kind of communicative aid of some description i guess uh yeah i mean that's one of the major advantages i think um of the video essay uh because at at any given time people are looking at their phones anyway or they're looking at, at at youtube and there is um there it's there's a lot of competition there's a there's a lot of potential mm-hmm. bits of content that you can have vying for your attention but at the same time there's there's, there's a sort of endless the endless hunger for for content and um it sort of feels it, it feels like a, 
almost almost silly in its inevitability that we should try to take some of the more important things that we feel are very important, uh, important philosophical ideas, or even complicated things that feel overwhelming at first glance, but then if you break them down over hours and hours of content or over an entire career, that actually there's no excuse to not make them accessible. And we're all just watching content anyway, right? So it's like this idea of us all looking at our screens or looking at content is in and of itself neutral to me. Um, mm. It is a development in it, it's what's happening. I mean, what am I going to do? Be old NB shaking fist at cloud and say, we shouldn't be, we should be out touching grass and looking at frogs. I mean, like, yeah, we should make some time to touch grass and look at frogs. But since it would seem that we are spending an awful lot of the rest of the time looking at content anyway, um, that it, it just makes sense to me. I, I don't. I don't really think that there are um, moral philosophical ideas, or um, you know, um, I, I, you know, anything too complicated. And um, ideas in terms of like mathematics or physics or or just the ontology of being. Um, I don't think that there's anything that the right team of persuasive writers and and and. Um, you know, educators with their with their head screwed on, right, can't make accessible for like pretty mm -hmm. much anyone at various levels. And that's very exciting to me because it's also art to me. So at a certain point, it's just like, yeah, and like you sure you'd be playing around with colors and sounds anyway. Uh, you might as well have the, the colors and sounds be uh, of that much utility and have that much potential. Yeah, one I mean, w one thing I try and always do when and I, whether I succeed in this is for other people to judge, but is when I'm writing something, I always if if there is kind of a complicated idea which I think is necessary to explain something, rather than sort of um, make something simpler and kind of uh, avoid that, is to try and kind of build some steps to it so that actually you do come away with that word because if we're or that bit of terminology or that concept because. You know, if we're sort of going in that direction anyway, we might as well make the entire detour and pick up that new idea rather than try and sand it down. And therefore we come away like I, I enjoy the journey as much as the destination, I think. And I and I think that's something that seems to be something that audiences enjoy from not only how people respond to uh, stuff that I've put out there, but also seeing other videos that that do well, um, particularly, uh, and maybe we'll come on to this, the kind of growth of just like really long videos right. um, seem to really uh, kind of celebrate that thing of the of the journey of how do you get to a conclusion as much as the conclusion itself. Um, what, one thing I did want to pick up on though was you're kind of talking about um videos as a format as being kind of neutral right of um i think you know th throughout history there has been every time a new form of something pops up a kind of new medium there's some level of moral panic about uh about that thing being bad whether it's sort of novels or whether it's mm -hmm. um uh blogs on the internet whether it's uh videos hello i hope you're enjoying my chat with neil if you are, and you'd like to check out further episodes of the show, then you'll probably want to know that every single one comes out a full two weeks early over on my streaming service, Nebula. If you watch a lot of video essays on YouTube, then you're probably broadly aware of Nebula. It's a premium streaming service built by myself and a bunch of other clever YouTubers and video creators. The goal is to reduce our reliance on the corporate behemoth that is YouTube by building a platform which we have ownership over and therefore a collective say in how it works. Recently, we've been working really hard to increase the amount of exclusive content on the platform. This includes video essays that you won't find anywhere else. If you want to check out Lindsay Ellis' latest videos on The Lord of the Rings, E.T. and Guy Fieri, for example, they are 100% exclusive to Nebula. Additionally, all subscriptions to Nebula now also include access to Nebula classes, in which creators share the skills and strategies that they use to write, produce, and edit their videos. 
if you, for some reason, want to hear more of my voice, for example, I recently released a whole hour and a bit long class in which I take you through the research process which I developed whilst undertaking my PhD, and which now helps me to write the videos which I release on my main channel. And, as I mentioned a moment ago, both the audio and video versions of every single episode of Induction come out a whole fortnight early on Nebula 2. So, if you want to listen to my chat with Jordan Harrod about the recent explosion in AI tools, then you can find that right now over on Nebula. If you want to sign up for Nebula, then the best way of doing so is by using my custom link go.nebula.tv forward slash induction. Using that link will bag you a full 40% off an annual plan, meaning that you get access to Nebula for just $2.50 a month. Which, that's a pretty good deal, right? It's a great way to get access to tons and tons of bonus clever content, whilst also supporting my work specifically, as some of that money comes back to me to help us continue making more episodes of Induction and main channel videos too. That link again is go.nebula.tv forward slash induction. But for now, back to my chat with Neil. Um, and I wondered to what extent do you feel that the fact that this has burgeoned on YouTube as a platform uh, rather than, I don't know, anywhere else, some kind of hypothetical other platform, like to what extent do you think like YouTube kind of shapes this? Because, um, I mean, you've talked about algorithms there a little bit, but to what extent do you think the sort of medium shapes message, I guess, in some way in, in that extent? Um, yeah, well, actually, we talked a little bit about this in our video on uh, dunking, um, which is essentially a video about the platform as much as it was about anything else. Because... Mm. Um, the sort of the the conclusion we came to in creating in creating that video, which was about like you know reaction content and dunking on other creators and and drama and and all that kind of thing, um, and the conclusion we came to was essentially like because because the Google algorithm will favor uh, content that has connections to other things that people are already watching, right? Um, so you know uh, some big news event happens. Uh, J.K. Rowling drops another essay about like how there's a certain category of person we should maybe try and get rid of, but in in the most in the most British and subtle of ways, um, and that happens, and then all of a sudden there's all these nodes and connections across the uh, mm -hmm. the whole of Google and YouTube, and those videos will get a lot of views in comparison to the videos that came out that week about uh, the mating habits of ducks or, um, you know, uh, some economic theory or whatever. Right. So the, the, and you know, this as a creator, right. The, 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 the algorithm is impossible to understand, but at its simplest and most sort of anthropomorphic form, you will appease it by also participating in discourse thing that is happening at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. That's very, a very, very easy to, uh, easy to kind of, uh, obey rule of the algorithm um and so that part of it frustrates the hell out of me because what and and that's just this is completely subjective now this is personal because there's going to be elements of this that are neutral that i perceive as as offensive to me um mm -hmm. but like i think the fact that sort of warfare and infighting is so rewarded and this kind of like surface level because because we all like especially like as leftist content creators um when you when you try to understand something like identity politics or intersectionality or uh, oppressive forces against marginalized people in general and you want to talk i want to talk about um you know the nature of identity and i want to talk about like the original thinkers and um because they sort of had their heads screwed on and they knew what they knew that they were defining certain identities purely in terms of oppression and they were defining others purely in terms of their interactions with other identities and so on and so forth but then because the, the flipping the algorithm and this platform will reward the sort of content that says no 
I'll tell you what racism is. Racism is this creator. I'll tell you what transphobia is. Transphobia is this creator. It's this person. They look like this. Here's their address, you know? And and we just do this thing where it's like, it's it's this sort of um, fervor of scapegoating um, that mm-hmm. really fails not just uh, to educate people on like, but the nature of internal biases, for example, is, is such like we all have them. Like, 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 patriarchy is a thing that affects us we interact with it uh white supremacy is a thing that affects us we interact with it we 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 re- recreate it and we reproduce it you know um, and it's interactive but no it just becomes this thing of like no white supremacy is this creator they haven't fixed their white supremacy so they're spreading the white supremacy and it's like such a surface level view but it, it, it does something else as well which is that it like it means that everything is reactionary, right? Um, and that's mm. reactionary as in like the, react, the, the, the nature of reactionary politics. So even like leftist political thought, that sort of development of, of, of leftist political thought and how we might be less white supremacy, we might be less patriarchy, gets entirely scuppered by this sort of circular conversation of reactionary on this side reactionary on this side and it's just react 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 and of course like youtube loves that because there's just more content right uh mm-hmm. both, both, both the sense of the the friction of the argument or or or, or debate or um sometimes something, some, something slightly more uh vindictive than that i guess um but also the fact that it has that, as you say, has that inbuilt connection to something already that already exists, and therefore the system can work out. Oh, you're going to you've seen that, therefore you would like to see this. Um, and I think sometimes, like trying to work out where the line between that being the uh, ones and zeros of the recommendation system itself, and where the and the extent to which that is the people that are watching mm-hmm. videos is kind of hard to uh hard to tell i think sometimes it's it's easy to imagine it's all the machine whereas actually some a lot of that is uh uh the machine learning from what we watch because actually if someone does create a, a video that says x is wrong about dot 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 sometimes we are more inclined to uh to go towards it than we would if something was framed in a much uh, broader, less directed way, I guess. Um, whereas sometimes maybe it is the the machine that is guiding us to be um, wanting to make those uh, connections. Um, it is, uh, yeah, I, 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 I there's been a little bit recently where sometimes I found that the YouTube algorithm has been recommending me stuff that has much fewer views or does just seem a little bit more left field. And Same actually here, I've actually. started, yeah, like, like I've, I've, I'll occasionally just get a video recommended and it's got 300 views or something, um, which actually I found is really interesting. And um, I definitely found that I used tiktok very briefly for a few months maybe six months ago and after a while i went off it because it was so it it sort of decided who i was and would would very only very rarely throw in a wild card to the point where it became quite a boring experience um as someone particularly i don't know as someone like all of us who has a bunch of different interests which don't necessarily always line up with one another at the same time um so for a while it would think i only wanted to watch clips from the news for a while it would think i only wanted to watch people talking about clip like current affairs um for a while it thought i only wanted to watch short videos about running like and it could never quite work out that this person might be might con- might contain maybe not multitude but <laughs> three things um like it could never quite uh or, or sort of didn't want to find those um things but i think it is interesting what you're saying about the ways in which we are 
creating stuff for YouTube as a platform is that it does sort of push people to be making videos about the same things. Um, like I think we've probably all noticed that every so often there'll be a period where everyone does their video about X, right? Um, mm -hmm. Probably in a period at the moment where everyone's going to everyone's doing an AI video in some way, shape, or form, or has recently done. I mean, I mentioned AI, I think, in my uh, in my upcoming video, and maybe uh, maybe some of that's natural, right? If something's in the air, that we're going to pick up on it and going to want to want to talk about it. But um, uh, but but also there is an extent, I think, as you're saying, um, to which you kind of have to i guess i i know there was definitely a shift in my stuff where initially i was i would like usually i come to making a video because there is some sort of concept or phenomenon i'm interested in or theoretical idea that i'm interested in explaining and early on when i was making videos i would frame that as dot 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 explained and therefore and sort of wait for someone to search on youtube that particular sure. thing and then find it whereas these days i will find what i tend to call a kind of hook uh where i will find a way uh of I, I will thank you siri i will these days i try and find a hook where by i can find something that people are talking about already and therefore i can use that as a way into talking about the concept that I want to discuss. Like w one of my the first videos that did really quite well was um, uh, ostensibly about Elon Musk and uh, Tesla and SpaceX, but mm -hmm. really was a kind of history of how we've thought about the future. And that was sort of what I wanted to make. Uh, and Elon Musk was just a kind of way of framing that to an audience, I guess. Um, but it is interesting how we do really have to think of, uh, kind of think of that. Um, one thing I have, I, th I mean, you were talking a little bit there about the, about kind of reaction content, I guess. And one thing I have been really interested in is the kind of growth of video essays as a, I am, Siri is really trying to, I don't <laughs> I really don't know how to get rid of Siri. Uh, no, thank you, Siri. Okay, wait, I'm going to take a very quick pause to just... You can't I think bad mouth algorithms because Siri will just come I along know. and start bullying you. Sorry, two seconds. Okay, I think I think she's gone. I think it's safe now. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, right. What was I going to ask you, Anne? I had a good... Okay, I was going to talk about... The expansion of video essays as a thing. Um, so one thing I was really interested to talk to you about, you talked about there about the ways in which content is quite react can become become quite reactive. Uh, and there's probably within the kind of range of stuff that you're thinking about there, there is probably content which I would probably not necessarily describe as video essays. Um, but there is and I think this has become quite, uh, this has become a kind of a phenomenon in which gradually the walls between what is video essay and what is some other kind of content, so what is commentary or, or drama or reaction or um, documentary, has become less clear. And I'm, I'm sort of not, this is not Tom Does Moral Panic, um, the, 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 the quality has degraded kind of thing. It's more just, I, I think it's quite interesting that, as the phrase video essay has become a really popular genre on YouTube, it's kind of eaten up a lot of uh, adjacent genres uh, to the extent that I think video essays have almost become to YouTube what at one point sort of true crime was to podcasts, <laughs> where the where it sort of is the associated genre with the platform um i wondered if that's something uh something that you'd noticed or something that you uh had any thoughts about does that worry you or maybe maybe that's really exciting maybe that's exciting the idea that we might see a, a much wider range of stuff within the umbrella of the video essay well yeah i um isn't it interesting 
I think it's just mostly interesting. I, I, I do think that like identifiers um, like genre, like identity <clears throat> are words that, that exist and, and change o- over time. I think you're absolutely right that it is sort of eaten. A, a good way to describe it is that it's eaten up some adjacent genre. And, and the other thing I think that's happened is that makes it particularly hard to spot when it becomes mini doc or when it becomes um, this is a reaction channel is if if a reaction channel does like a little a little sequence about the history of something, then there's sort of borrowing from the tropes of video essay. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, I mean, you could say that they're 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 cynically legitimizing a lesser <laughs> format, or you could just say that they're 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 mixing uh, genres, you know. And and similarly with the with a with a mini doc. Um, if you, if you just cut from voice of God to like, Hey, this is editing John, uh, and you're just in your play and it's like, okay, well then you've borrowed from the, the tropes of the video mm-hmm. essay too. Right. And, but essentially like the, the rapper that goes around all of this is pretty, it's like the least important part, if not meaningless, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and to me, you know, I, I, one, I care less about like, do I get to have that descriptor do, you know, uh, what? As long as I'm, as long as what I'm doing is video essay, and I get to do video essay, I don't really care about that part so much as I'm, I'm interested in doing things, you know, interesting things. And two, it's like, well, if you look at a genre that's defined by, defined entirely by its tropes, I think it has a greater chance of extinction, like the Western, you know, um, mm-hmm. where it's a series of, uh, it's like a checklist, right, of of tropes, of like identifiable aesthetics. And aesthetic ideas and you can experiment within those you can shake them up but it won't ever evolve out of an entirely entirely into something new right the closest would be like well star wars exists star wars is like a, a, a semi-vibrant surviving um you know uh a, 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 what's the opposite of an ancestor like a like a the offspring of yeah. of of yeah. uh of the western but westerns themselves as a genre it's not going to ever you know it's not going to have its day again and i think similarly with video essays I, I i think like i wouldn't want it to be defined by its tropes um mm. because actually the the tropes are already they've been obnoxious for a while and um, mm-hmm. we we should want to consider the tropes sort of stifling. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think if you're in the, if you're in the vibrant part of of an artistic movement, you should sort of have a healthy amount of contempt for it, right? <laughs> you yeah, should sort yeah, of yeah. feel like I'm sick of oh I'm sick of the way everybody does this, but I kind of think it's funny and it kind of turns me on, so I'm going to play with it. Um, I, I, I'm sick of the way everyone does this and I, I think this is really lazy so I'm going to do this with it um, but you're sort of simultaneous you're sort of in that like you know a, a year a year shy of the divorce energy you know <laughs> you have you want to move on but you are in love you know that's yeah, the place that's, to be with a movement that's really interesting actually because I some I have had conversations previously where I've um, uh, been doing a talk or I bumped into people I, I think I was I'd done a talk and someone someone asked me kind of oh you know it, would you describe what you do as um video essays? or sort of said oh you'd you'd describe yourself as making video essays right um and I suddenly did go oh like it's interesting like I suddenly realized that I hadn't got a clear answer to that question that I that when I was creating stuff I didn't necessarily wasn't trying to pigeonhole the stuff I was creating and so then it and so I did almost have that that, that that sense that you were saying of being like oh I you know don't I don't want to to box me in but at mm. the same time as soon as I look at my work from the outside I do go oh I can see how there are tropes within that and so that I think probably all of us have that same kind of love hate relationship um I mean it's been interesting that there's both been over the past sort of three or four years definitely there has been both a diversification but also a solidification of the genre in some ways in what on the edges you have this either bleed into it being unclear where sort of video essay ends and 
reaction or commentary uh, content and but also this much more vibrant kind of toying with with genre and deciding no i'm not going to have section titles i'm just going to have something that's much more freeform or going to toy around with how things are, are made in really exciting ways but then also there's this kind of corporatization of the video essay as well um like sometimes where we're looking back at something and we're gonna call that this this sounds a bit vox this bit of script mm. this sounds a bit Without, you know, without wanting to um, completely uh, disregard what they do, there, there has been a slightly more uh, corporate core to uh, video essays as well, where there is a much more... Um, where it's, where the, the tropes of the genre have become so clear that a, a team from a uh, big corporate media entity can start sort of churning them out in a kind of Fordian production line. Um, and so I think there is that really interesting uh, friction between this this center that that has almost, as you say, I don't know, sometimes I feel as a single subjective audience member can feel a bit cold and a bit uh, by the numbers maybe, and this kind of broader uh, outskirts where I, I mean, I, yeah, where, where I, I, dent to tread uh myself i guess I, like I, I i feel a bit more like i color it more in the lines than some of those people uh on the outskirts um i mean one thing i wanted to talk to you about because it, it feels like one of the trends that's been a long a sort of gradual trend but that i think really has become noticeable as a thing in the last couple of years is the trend towards like really long um essays um mm -hmm. because i think that's always been a thing right i think people often talk about in the history of uh video essays becoming a thing is the sort of algorithm shift uh, i think kind of early 2010s where youtube moved away from a uh system where it would recommend videos based on how many views they got towards a system where it would recommend them based on the amount of watch time and that kind of allowed people to make longer videos and also tacitly incentivized them to because the more video you had the more watch time you could get the more it was likely to get uh recommended not that people were necessarily doing that in that really uh kind of noticing it and just trying to play the algorithm kind of way but that it kind of encouraged that quietly in the background um and now we've got to this place where video essays are regularly hitting kind of two, three, four hours. I think uh, someone made, I've seen some that are like 10 hours long. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you make relatively, you, you and Sarah make relatively uh, beefy bits of work. I mean, I've, no, I've no idea how you do it at the regularity you do it it would um it would drive me into the ground um wh what are your feelings towards that kind of gradual elongation of the of the video essay you know it's interesting because the the one to one obviously you're presenting the question like yes watch time was incentivized but that we both know that's not a one to one because the algorithm since gone through a, a, like a couple of permutations where like, well, now we have YouTube shorts and there's sort of like a bit of confusion mm -hmm. around exactly what we're trying to do. And we're all kind of aware of that. And I think probably that, that definitely had a role to play in getting the, in getting the ball rolling. Um, but for, for us, for example, like our, our videos are getting increasingly long. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I'm going to like fully blame Sarah. No, uh, I, I think what's interesting is that like I would have probably had like the showbiz hat on and tried to kind of call the stops and go like, wait, now, now this is good, but can it be more efficient or, or should we, you know, mm -hmm. simplify that to, to get from A to B sooner? We need to compromise. And it was sort of in the last, in the last eight months of content creation, Sarah turning around to me and saying, but we are compromising. Um, but what, what we're not, just look at the way we're compromising. We're, we're not writing books. We're not, we're, we're not writing sort of the seminal book on this thing. But what we are doing is we're covering the subject properly. And we're getting mm -hmm. from, from where we set out to where it finishes, 
without compromising on that. Um, and in, mm. and in the journey in the middle, we're having to oversimplify things. We're having to reduce things down. We're having to turn certain whole schools of philosophy into just one line joke. You know, um, there's definitely like brevity uh, with, within that. But I think that there's a, a real, I think it's just like once, once people start giving permission to each other, then we might all have slightly different reasons or there might be that, that might be a sort of mutual energy to go like, well, I want to cover this properly and this is our genre like in in some ways it's almost like um like uh prog songs you know like prog songs that are like 30 minutes long it's like well it's our it's our mm -hmm. genre like we can we can make a song 30 minutes long if we want isn't that interesting isn't that like you know and we can make a 10 hour yeah. video essay if we want to i mean if i want if i feel like that that would be what i would do if i if i could totally make all the decisions myself and then you go and you look at it it's like well it's between me and google so I guess I'm just going to go ahead and, and do that and see how many people watch it. Um, so freeing yourself up to make, and then, and then having an audience that supports it is another big component for us. Like, um, because you don't want to alienate the audience you have or the, or the patrons or the, you know, the sort of the loyal fan base and that, that feedback loop is as much a part of the creative process for us as anything else is, as is our relationship with our peers and the community um, but if everybody is sort of relatively supportive and just like, yeah, go for it, you know, like if you want to cover this subject properly, take a couple months to make the video, make it three hours long and tell us a proper story properly. Um, and I think that that is perfectly reasonable. And I also think because the permission is given, then you will also have a, an amount of people who, who just don't know how to edit themselves <laughs> and and just yes. and, and just don't know what to cut out and that's kind of interesting too anyway i mean that you know why not why not just like let's have everyone listen to this one person who just includes every detail for for five hours i mean isn't that interesting isn't that isn't that a progression of the medium you know i mean i think what you're saying about efficiency is really interesting and then the kind of the ability to be overly efficient sometimes i I definitely feel that. I mean, I'm sort of similar in that I, my dream is always to make a really tight 20 minute video. Mm. And then gradually it turns out that the topic I'm covering, oh, I sort of need to talk about that. And I sort of need to talk about that. And even so end up kind of whittling stuff down. And sometimes I do look at the final draft of a section and I go, oh, if, if I did have more time, if the, if the economics of it would allow me an extra month to make this video, actually, would I pare it down quite that much? Because, you know, I definitely find as a viewer of videos, sometimes I do enjoy that little, not necessarily a detour, but the little, a little additional anecdote that adds Ooh. a bit of color to the thing, which actually maybe helps me to remember the, the, thing that i've learned about um about this particular aspect of uh, the the story that i'm listening to um and i mean i think the uh the relationship with the audience is also interesting um what you're talking about there because i think it's easy sometimes to assume that responding to an audience is kind of base in some kind of way right that it's easy to go oh well actually if no one watches uh, I, you know, I should just create what I want to create. And, um, if no one watches it, it's cause I'm creating, um, stuff that is too intellectual or, or is high art that no one, no one understands me in my lifetime. But actually, you know, I definitely find that I, I, I sort of want to make stuff that people uh, like in some way, like that people find useful, I, I guess, in some way, particularly if some aspect of this is about, which I think it is for a, a lot of people that make stuff that sits in the video essay ballpark that a lot of people are trying to do something that is educational or instructional or has some kind of that kind of value to it um therefore i do want people to watch it and to, um and that you know if something is getting viewed all the way through or not that i you know i, w I would like people to do so and i would sort of take that feedback on board um i don't know to what extent uh, you kind of let that into your process as well. Oh, I mean, there is no perfect answer, but like that, I always, 
I, I'm very grateful that there's two of us on this channel because it means that I can kind of play that role of, of the good old fashioned entertainer um, and have those concerns and sort of bring them to the meetings. Um, even if I don't fully, even if, if it was just me, I'd be much more compromising about it. And, and it probably, it may be true on, on Sarah's side as well, that it's like, well, we have to tell the truth and we have to tell the truth properly and comprehensively. Um, and we can't, we can't fudge terms of art and we can't insult people's intelligence and those sorts of values. And we can't take shortcuts, you know, um, mm. and that, that tension is, is, great like that's where that's really mm-hmm. where the vibrant part comes from but um in terms of like i mean having an audience react um you know as i say i come from like at various points i've been a professional musician and if they're not dancing maybe you're probably doing something wrong you know and i've also um been a, a stand-up comedian and like if they're not laughing patently you're doing something wrong and now with this it's like well one if they're not learning you're doing something wrong, but also with what we try to do, like at this point, it's almost like if they're not crying, you're doing something wrong. And if, if people aren't like coming out as, as trans or neurodivergent or, you know, like, uh, like talking to their parents again, those sorts of things, if you're not seeing some amount of like, and then I really was affected and changed, then I think we, we wouldn't quite be doing what it is we're trying to do. So the audience part, um, I think it's like, it, it's less, it's less a thing that you sort of actively cultivate. And it's more a thing of like, when it happens, you go with it, you, you, you continue down that approach. Um, you, you, it's a, it's a, it's a positive feedback loop, right? Um, mm. that approach that we took on this video drove us to emboldened us to the approach in the next video. And without the audience, we wouldn't know. Um, mm. so yeah, it's like, it's, it's tremendously important. And I think, I think as well, like of all the media, yeah, it's interesting. Like, because obviously the, the, like the, the, the genius artist struggling alone to, to say the, the completely true thing. I, I just, I feel like it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really even fit with like a leftist framework you don't mm. want to have thought leaders like in an, in an ideal academic structure, in an egalitarian structure, in an idealized uh, horizontal political structure. You wouldn't want to have like, and then there's the person we go to for all the answers, you know, yeah. like you would yeah, need yeah. to have these nodes between everyone. And so the, the sort of dissolution of creator to creator, collaborator to collaborator, and also like the dissolution of that parasocial hierarchy of creator to audience and audience to creator Mm -hmm. is not something to be afraid of. It's actually something to embrace. And I mean, like we've had tons of, of, um, amazing, generous, um, you know, people on our discord server or like people DMing us or, or, you know, replying to things and saying like, Hey, I've got all these academic resources. I'm actually like, I'm researching this right now. It's really interesting. You might be. And then it's like, okay, well let's go let's go mm. like that's mm. great um so yeah that's I, I i think that there is much a part of what we're doing as as we are yeah i forget who it was but i saw i think it was one of those where you're kind of watching a conversation happen on twitter that you're not actually participating in but um i, I was watching someone talk about uh streaming and uh, st- streaming isn't i i do not really watch any streams um it's uh sort of i don't know it's i'm, I'm just i'm just an old i'm just an old man um <laughs> and <laughs> there's no, no no particular value judgment i'm just i'm just old uh but i i was reading someone t- talking about it as as you know it, it can be it can lean into uh, slightly less useful ways sometimes i think because if someone is online for eight hours a day, they just have to find something to talk about. So it can mm. lead people into just talking about sort of nonsense for a while or like having quote unquote bad takes because they're just having to have takes all the time. Right. And they're not all gonna, they're not all gonna hit the bullseye. Um, but I was listening to someone talk about it as a kind of collaborative form of knowledge production. And I found that to be really interesting, actually, this idea that, you can be working through an idea and actually being able to have that instant audience feedback. Um, there is some potential there, even if it's not always realized there is some 
potential there. Um, and I've kind of been thinking a lot about that interaction with audience uh, recently. Um, I mean, I, I do not make work that is as kind of vulnerable and personally explorative as I think uh, you, you and Sarah's work very often is. I'm very much uh, kind of het british guy and who is very closed off to um i will talk about um the, his- the, the history and i might tell you that i went to the shops once like uh, uh <laughs> very unrevealing about my life um but i found it really interesting we, we recently did a uh, sort of mini series about uh, to coincide with the coronation um and again it was all very very dry history stuff but it was kind of interesting that putting out a video every kind of one and a half weeks i think it was for a month or so it was really exciting actually to have this kind of ongoing exchange on a topic with an audience in a way that when i disappear to a mind palace for two months and then descend with a video it doesn't feel quite the same and there was something really exciting about that and i'm kind of interested in doing a bit more of that in the future now of going actually maybe sometimes we make something that's a little bit shorter uh and maybe maybe isn't less in isn't less in depth but maybe asks a slightly smaller question to begin with so it's maybe just a little bit more narrow in its focus uh maybe we can have more of that ongoing um uh loop with an audience where sort of presenting with them some, with some ideas and then hearing thoughts back um because I guess that's the thing that's that sets YouTube, which I guess is where we kind of started this conversation. The thing that sets YouTube apart from something like Netflix or something uh, like other streaming platforms, which, as a pure user experience, are relatively similar, is the fact that there is that feedback loop of either you could make a whole someone who watches your video could make a whole other video, but also there is a comments thread um stuff like patreon is very baked into the the culture that exists around it and so that there is that interaction with between creator and audience which doesn't exist in um other on other platforms and within other contexts and so i guess it's about kind of using that to its full potential i guess which it sounds like is something that you and sarah very much do um, I mean, well, well, um, thank you very much for all all of the flattery there. But I, I think I'm pretty much on the same page. Uh, the, the way I think about it is, um, you know, for a long time, and even even now, still, I think this it you could call it a moral panic or or just a kind of um, uh, maybe just a social postmodern self commentary thing. Um, where we're all worried about the amount of media that we consume, and then deriving our value systems and our notions of reality from media right so you know mm. um there there are a lot of contemporary like the kind of the more recent post modern post structuralist philosophers all sort of having the same conversation about like and people like like um like Baudrillard having the same conversation about like the simulated reality and we look at the world of film and television and we see the simplistic morals or the like consistent like lack of mistakes like um and then we see the real world and the the world is is full of like weird coincidences and full of like tiny little mistakes and like um non sequiturs and things that have no meaning and and we see that and and it, it causes like an internal crisis of meaning and you know and i actually think that while i while i do think that a lot of the like panic around our sense of reality is self-fulfilling and overblown, frankly. Um, that like reality is the thing that we, we we exist in, whether or not it is composed of looking at phone screens. Um, and we should be careful about those terms. But I also think that like, well, if we take that seriously, then the problem of the artificial, the artifice created for us by the creators uh, is somewhat tempered by this dissolution, this reintegration into community. Um, and like Jean-Paul Sartre talks about, like, uh, you know, authenticity is not something that we like achieve ever. It's something that we're constantly chasing. Right. And I think that like 
we're in an artistic process where the consumer becomes the creator, the creator becomes the consumer. We all are in this like feedback loop and we dissolve the walls between commentary and art. And we dissolve the walls between the nerds who want to just talk about the details of Spider-Man and the very people making the the very thing that Spider-Man is, is composed of the nerdy commentary upon Spider-Man, be it editor notes in the corners or like there's there's the in joke about Ben Riley. Here's, you know, uh, here's the literal like action lines drawn into the movie. You know, here here is the canon as a plot point. Um, yeah, we're yeah, in yeah. an artistic process where we're in we're in a like a zeitgeist moment where we are dissolving the barriers between reality, commentary, and art from the other side now, uh, where mm-hmm. we we kind of get our authenticity back again um, because we're not being told how things should be. We're part an active the audience is an active part of what the content should be. So we're back to just making our own reality again. See, it sorted itself out. <laughs> you've, you've brought that brilliantly circularly back to uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which I didn't think was going to be both the jumping off point and the landing point for this conversation. But, uh, but it's as good a thing <laughs> as any <laughs> to be our, our kind of stake in the ground. Um, there's, so, there's so much more to talk about here about um, the authenticity online, about... Um, you know, singular creators versus uh, collaborative creators. Um, but, but that does kind of bring us to uh, the the amount of time that, that we have for today. Siri again making an appearance is desperate to insert. <laughs> I'll miss um, Siri. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so, so much, Neil. If, if people would like to find uh, your work and you and Sarah's work, uh, h- how would they go about doing so? Well, yeah. Uh, well, we're over on youtube.com forward slash the leftist cooks. Um, also on Twitter at the leftist cook and at Saribo, S A R I B E A U X. Um, and uh, challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just in general, you'll see us knocking around in the, in the circles of all the other content creators uh, on social media. But um, that's the channel, anyway, is the leftist cooks. We have a jolly good time. We'll have a video coming out at some point in the next whenever probably about spider-verse oh perfect oh that was obviously on your mind then well thank you yeah thank you so so much for setting aside some time to uh chat to me and thank you to everyone that is listening and or watching for doing that as well thank you Thank you so, so much for listening to my chat with Neil. I hope you found it as interesting as I did whilst recording it. There was loads that we couldn't get to. The topic was so broad and interesting. As I said partway through the show, if you want to get early access to episodes of Induction, alongside a whole host of exclusive video essays and more, then you can do so by signing up to Nebula at go.nebula.tv forward slash induction. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you in the next episode of the show.